I always get sort of nervous when people start using uh, human evolutionary capacity as, a, as an explanation. And one of the reasons for that is the places that I work in, for example, I've been in Sri Lanka for the last year, and I've been working on village tank systems, and these village tank systems are about 1,500 years old, and they've been sustainable for all of that time. And I, I, was at a, I was at a session where we talked about um, societies that have been sustainable for long periods of time, and I stood up and, as is usual, I said, well, is, is there something about these, all these societies that have been sustainable for these long periods of time? And the anthropologist who was there kind of stopped for a second, and he said, eventually he said, that's a really good question, and I think that all of these sustainable societies had ancestor worship. And to myself, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, they seem to me to be using all available resources. They seem to me to be they seem to me to be a fairly high version of human evolution. And yet, the way you're talking, it it sounds as if our our human evolutionary capacity is to do what John Livingston used to refer to as the rogue primate. That we are out there to do all of this. Um, to use up everything and so on, and yet I know all these societies that um, seem to be quite capable and they seem to be at a quite high evolutionary level of being sustainable. So, do you have a version of that or some other alternative? Well, I, again, I don't think there's any absolute truth, but we have a different take on that. It, what human evolutionary ecologists do is look at a lot of the kind of literature of society. So, for example, we take Australian animals sometimes held up as the longest live, most sustainable society on the planet. They've been there for 50,000 years. But if we look at the history of the Aboriginal occupation of Australia, what we find is an invasion from the north of, of, of the original people. And as they progress through the continent, there's a sequential elimination of the megafauna and much of the, uh, virtually half the animal species that lived in Australia before um, the human beings arrived. There was a huge increase in the human population as a result, which then crashed, and the current, and for the last several thousands of years, Aboriginal culture has lived in a stable configuration with the ecosystems of which they are a part. But it's, it's the, after the bust, you see. So they've been forced by circumstance uh, to adapt uh, through uh, dream time and other uh, kinds of cultural exercise. Or they learn better. Or, well, well, they did, but the, the thing is, when exposed to a new environment with these unlimited resources, they used them all up. And once they ran out of those resources, they plummeted. And we've seen this over and over again, it, it appears, uh, around the planet. So there's no question that human societies can learn to live uh, in balance with their local ecosystems. But it's always after, or it seems to be generally the case, I can't always say always, that it's done after they've eliminated the easily, what do we say, the easily picked fruit or the low hanging fruit or whatever, then they adapt to what's left. So that unfortunately is by the way, the way any species behaves. So what we have to understand is that we're just behaving the way species behave. And if you think of several human characteristics, we are short, you know, everybody says, well, you're being very short-sighted. Short-sightedness is an adaptive strategy. Economists have even recognized it in the concept of discounting. People tend to prefer the here and now to future times and distant places. And they do so for very good evolutionary reasons. Uh, fruit would rot if you didn't eat them now. There's no point in preserving them in the absence of, of refrigeration. There's many, many things about human behavior that can be explained by that kind of thinking and model. Some of them even get taken up in economics. So yeah, I agree with Peter. There are many cultures that have adapted absolutely to their local circumstances, but we're looking at them long after the uh, period uh, in which they inhabited and settled in those regions. So which is the evolutionary adaptively it seems to me that they're actually are doing a very good evolutionary adaptive strategy. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Of course it is. I mean, that's how you survive under constraints. Now, okay, let, let's be really provocative here for a moment. If you look at some of the slides we've seen in, in this session, we see 
the human progress suddenly exploding in the last 150 or 200 years. I mean, there's a fourfold increase in human numbers in the 20th century alone, from a billion and a half to six billion. And we're on a way we're told to 10 billion. But that entire explosion assumes the availability of the energy and other resources required to sustain that level of human biomass and all of the animals and plants and so on that, that support it. It ain't there. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a plausible argument that we are doomed to crash. Just as other cultures have crashed many, many times before, only this time it will be a global crash. That doesn't mean we go extinct, but it does mean that we are going to have to adapt to very different circumstances after the crash. I'm assuming, of course, the crash is not a nuclear war, which may be possible given the conflict that we're going to have over the diminishing resource supply. But the point is we are headed for a fall one way or the other. In one of my recent papers, I've tried to say, look, there are two ways of dealing with this. We can just let nature take its course, in which case, just like any other species in plague phase, we will crash. Or we can plan what uh, Howard Odom called a prosperous way down. We can actually recognize what's driving us, uh, see why it's, it's taken us this far, understand that the resource base isn't there to sustain 10 or 12 billion people at our material standard. So how do we create a world in which there is greater equity, greater economic security, less ecological instability, in which the population can survive at a much reduced material standard, but that doesn't necessarily mean a lower quality of life, as Peter Victor's work shows us. So there's solutions here. We know what we have to do, but as long as we're caught in our cognitive loops, we ain't gonna do it. And that's the problem we have to come to recognize, in my humble opinion. Not hmm. a very humble opinion. <laughs> um, well, if I could just, uh, touch base on one of the things that I said. I think, I think if we're going to try and find a new model of the self, I think we're going to be trying to internalize this question of being bounded or finite or limited, which people in this society essentially hate. Any, any boundary. I, I had a conversation with somebody about the Rockstone diagrams. We may all know about the Rockstone diagrams. And, and the number one, this is a friend of mine who's an economist, a different kind of economist, um, and he basically said, well, what's going to be really interesting is how close we can get to that boundary. Like, can we go over it? How much can we go over it? And that's the way the society functions. The society functions by taking, looking at a boundary and go, well, how can we go? Like, this is kind of how it works. So I, I think we're into trying to come up with a new way of thinking about um, people in the world. And, and the, the places where I think of them will be, and Bill's mentioned the word, so I thought I'd sort of bring it in. I think we need to think about conditions and not constraints, that the way in which we live is actually conditioned by the resources, by the, by the earth itself. I remember reading, a, I've lost the reference, about a man who went mad because he thought there was a conspiracy to make him breathe using air. And he was trying to find a way of breathing without using air because it was so dangerous to use to breathe air. And I think that's the way a lot of people think about the environment, that somehow if we could break free of the conditions of the earth, we would somehow be free. And, but actually, it's the conditions of the earth that make us free. And I think until we actually got to that way of thinking about it, then we are probably heading straight for the collapse that you are painting. So, so again, I think we have some real agreement here. Humans do tend to see boundaries with hostility because we don't want to be constrained. No species wants to be constrained. So we naturally see them in that way. But we have to recognize why is it that we see them as boundaries instead of conditions? I mean, I, you've really got to read this paper because it's a brilliant uh, description of the kind of cognitive shift that needs to take place before we uh, can move to a point of recognizing that these are conditions in which we live rather than barriers to our perpetual progress in a direction that cannot be sustained on this planet. But that's a huge mental shift. And remember my opener, we are lived by forces we scarcely understand. If we come to understand what makes us see these uh, boundaries with hostility and not see them as conditions of existence, uh, then maybe we can make that Shift. By the way, wouldn't it be interesting if the political war going on in Canada today were talked about in these terms? 
Wouldn't it be interesting if our politicians were actually talking instead of about how to maintain the perpetual growth machine? But how can we recognize the conditions under which we live and create a society that can adapt to those conditions in, and flourish? This, you know, the, the, the classical real insight, I think, that, that, that Herman Daly gave us, not an insight, but a model of the steady state economy is not a, a stagnant state, it's a dynamic, constantly changing, innovative state of being with a constant throughput of energy and material that's consistent with the, bar you know, the barriers, the real biophysical barriers of this planet. But it imposes no constraints whatever on human development and, and so on and so forth. So this Andreas is desperate. Okay. Sorry, Andreas. So there's many questions again. So, so hopefully we'll run the discussion a little bit further. Uh, on a similar thing, I guess, yeah, are we bound to expand uh, until we uh, fall, or, uh, uh, fill our habitat or how? But how does uh, dropping birth rates currently fit in? Uh, is that culture winning over evolution? Or is it because we are already outside our uh, limits? They don't want the longer the short answer. <laughs> what that represents is well, a whole variety of things. Peter may have a different theory. First of all, birth control. People haven't stopped uh, doing the reproductive act. What they've done is prevented it from, from coming to fruition. In countries, by the way, every country in which uh, we're seeing a stabilizing or falling birth rate is already vastly overpopulated, far beyond its domestic carrying capacity. So it's both a psychological feedback, in my view, plus the Im impact of technology. Plus, by the way, the ingraining as part of our mental uh, equipment of selfish, uh, self you know, self-interested hedonism. I know several people who have sworn not to have children because they don't want it to impinge on their ability to consume automobiles and flat screen TVs. One of my main aims with my students is to try and get rid of the Puritanism in environmental in environmental studies. If I can get rid of a lot of that Puritanism, I'm really happy. I say to my students, I want to make the world safe for parties. I want to make it possible to people to go to Paris on weekends. If you can't do that, I don't want to be part of the environmental movement, but if you want to be able to do that in perpetuity, you're going to have to give up a lot of stupid stuff that you think that you actually need. But I want to make the world safe for parties. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, and sex. <laughs> hey, it's getting safer for sex. Uh, could you say, but I was, I guess, I'm not sure quite what to do that. Yeah, um, you just got married, Andrea, so you should know. <laughs> He's looking rather tired, isn't he? Okay, well, back to the popular music. <laughs> so, uh, a good example, kind of rather kind of personal, nevertheless, but I got married when I was 38. Uh, you know, where uh, population is not just a function of, uh, of techno technology, it is a function of uh, of education. I think it's a different pattern with, whereby which you know our education does change part of that uh, cultural paradigm uh, that we need to break out of. And uh, I, I don't, uh, who knows when we'll, we'll get there uh, close enough uh, before a certain collapse hits. Uh, however, I think it's a different factor than just, um, you know, just technology. Is that a question or an assertion? <laughs> of course, you know. I have a comment. Okay. I have great difficulty with the theory of collapse. I think one of the reasons is because much of it has been uh, focused on two or three examples, and a lot of it has to do with uh, first world countries, thinking about uh, Edward Gibbon and so on. A lot of it is happening right now because of very strange television programs. These very strange television programs, in order for the television programs to happen, they have to have a family or families that have survived somewhere from a nuclear holocaust or whatever it is, so as to be able to have next week's program. So a lot of people think that they're going to be able to survive things with 10 acres and a shotgun or something. And there's these models of collapse and how the society is going to continue afterwards. Novels, Cormac, McCarthy, Margaret. There's a whole now genre of collapse in some of you you may know that some of it is very, very strange. 
And I think these model, mental models of collapse are extremely dangerous and that they are not grounded, I think, in, in lots of other cultural ways of thinking about the way in which cultures have grown and shifted. I think, I think it's, a, it's, a it's, a, it's a problem. And the reason why I feel so strongly about this was because I wrote a book in 1982 called Vulnerability and the Collapse of Society uh, with reference to climate change. So I'm partly responsible for bringing collapse into the, into the language of environmentalism and for which I deeply apologize. Unless anyone will be misimpressed, misinformed, I'm not saying for a moment that it's inevitable. I am saying that unless we recognize the cycles within which we are entrained, we have no chance of breaking free. Okay? You have to recognize your chains before you can break free of those chains. So I agree absolutely with both of my colleagues that education is extremely important. But listen, I once said to Herman Daly, well, why aren't we teaching, you know, why couldn't he find a job in an American university since he was the leading edge? of economics. He said, no, no American university has even asked to interview me. This is when he left the World Bank. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, because the economics profession is populated by old farts who are determined to repopulate the world with old farts after they've gone. That was Herman Daly's, that it was tremendous insight to me. We keep replicating the failing model in our university system. How many programs of ecological economics or anything resembling biophysical economics are there in North America today? Almost none. And where they exist, they're on the fringes, usually funded by something outside of the mainstream. So it becomes extremely difficult to break from these cognitive uh, loops that we get ourselves into. And re you know, so who was it who said earlier today, economics changes one death at a time? It's because if the old guys move out, you might have a new chair that has a little different view. Um, so if I can add, uh, I think there's a, a many questions again on, on, a, on a spectrum. One that uh, I guess chooses one versus the other arguments, uh, and then another more practical than what do we do? So uh, Dan O'Neill says here, as eco ecological economists, we know the problem. How do we break out of the cycle that you have described? Um, rephrase it differently, how do we choose our formal society? Um, but it seems that this, this form is, is uh, foreclosed, it's already chosen for us, or, or is it not? And I guess this goes back to the discussion yesterday um, at the plenary, where Peter put forward this um, uh, can you see memo on, on where we could use uh, these same uh, patterns that the right, the right has chosen to uh, condition us, if you will, or, or uh, stack the deck on a particular um, uh, social contract of sorts. Uh, how do we break out that cycle? Can I, um, can I tell just a very brief story? Nobody minds. Many years ago, I used to do a lot of work in interfaith uh, work, and um, there was a Hare Krishna temple in Toronto that crashed and burned because of a whole range of different things. They, they brought a Hindu uh, uh, gentleman uh, off the ashram. I don't think he had been off the his entire life, and he came to Toronto. And uh, <clears throat> it turned out that I had to look after him for a couple of days. And on the last day before he was going to go back home, um, he and his translator sat in the Delta Chelsea watching television because he never actually watched television. And um, I took him to the airport and we sat, we actually went to Niagara Falls that one day, which was amazing. And anyway, so um, we had to go to the airport and we sat there for a while. And I said, well, what did you learn from watching television all day? And he said, and I won't do it in a Peter Sellers Indian voice, you'll be pleased to hear. It was this translator at Translate Forum and he said, well, one of the things that I've learned watching television is that everybody in this world seems to be obsessed with choosing. Nobody chooses from behind door number one or door number two. Everybody chooses this kind of food. And, and when people are making decisions through the day, they're making decisions and they're choosing. And choosing is essential to their freedom and the way they're going to make choices. In our culture, that's not very important. And it has to do with something to do with choosing to go to heaven or hell in your tradition, something very strange. In our culture, we're very strong about our way of life and the way in which we live. And the way in which we live, 
many choices aren't choices. They just happen to be the way we live. I think this, there are these questions about what, what path can we choose in things, but it may be not so much about choosing, it's about perhaps just walking the path. Uh, Peter Brown has an amendment to the story that was told earlier about Henry Daly. Yeah, so, uh, just an amendment to what Bill said about uh, American universities, which is uh, mainly true, 99.9% uh, .9 true, I think. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of give in the system, but... So when Herman, uh, who I was head of the um, environment program at the University of Maryland Public Policy School, we had a senior position open. Oh, I phoned Herman at the World Bank when I got the position. I'd never met him, and I said, I wondered if he would be willing to consider applying for the position. And he said, um, no, he wasn't, he wasn't interested because he thought he could make a difference at the bank, and that was very important, so of course I let it go. Several months later, I heard from him we were just about to close on somebody else, and he said, well, you know, I'm pretty frustrated here. Maybe, uh, maybe we can still talk. So I said, great, you know, just come out give a talk and uh, you know, see what we can do. So we came in pretty short notice, gave a talk, and it uh, was very good. It was on uh, the difference between absolute and comparative advantage. And um, there were several economists in the, in the audience, and uh, they said, uh, so it's an issue we all discussed, and they said, well, it's impossible. It doesn't understand economics, right? So you know, it's not an economist. It's a whole thing. It's just no So anyway, went up for a vote, failed. So anyway, I was uh, named Jonathan, he's in the room now. Enjoy this. I was, a few days later, I was at Tufts, and Eva Goodwin was giving a talk um, in, a, you know, in a seminar, and she said, uh, well, we need to get Herman Daly uh, into the university so we can get some graduate students so we can spread the word about ecological economics. So I said, this is short, I'll be short, it's a pretty long story, but I'm compressing it quite a bit. So, um, Anyway, uh, he said, uh, so I, 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 I told uh, the person sitting next to me the story of what had just happened, and it turned out to be Michael Northrup from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And he said, uh, well, we're going to fix that problem. Uh, we'll raise the money, and then we'll go back to the university, and we'll see if they'd like to change their minds. Anyway, the rest of it is a little pretty long and detailed story, but it actually worked. And then uh, once he got to the uh, uh, all barriers uh, fell, right, and uh, everything was uh, endured. So money talks. Money, money talks. <laughs> Can I just add uh, to that money talks thing? Uh, Dan O'Neill said, how do we break out of the cycle that I've described? Well, what we have to realize is what we're up against. In, how many of you have heard of the Powell Memo? I think Peter mentioned it or somebody mentioned it last night. Who about the Lewis Powell Memorandum on the internet and follow all the linkages? Uh, this is 1970. It was a memorandum written by a corporate lawyer to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce saying we are in trouble because of environmentalism, civil rights, and a whole variety of other communist and left-wing movements. movements. Uh, we are disorganized. We must organize to confront this emerging reality, or the corporate values upon which America are based will disappear. Now, at that time, 1970, there were virtually no think tanks in the United States. By 10 years ago, there were 790, which can trace their roots back uh, to that period. It wasn't the only thing going on, but it was an enormously important influence on uh, seeing corporate money flow into departments of economics, into the creation of think tanks. How many of you have heard of the Cato Institute, or the Heartland Institute, or the uh, Center for New American Progress? They're all the result of this corporate flood of funding to literally and purposefully reframe political discourse and rewire our cognitive understanding of the nature of reality. And it's been inordinately successful. Huge resources put into changing the North American and increasingly the global mindset to accept only the market as the great arbiter of all social values. I mean, several speakers have spoken uh, to that point already. This is social construction purposefully oriented towards serving the interests of a particular group. Now, this is a horrific problem to attempt to overcome because 
of the enormous resources available to the corporate sector in defense of their particular fiefdom. The Koch brothers alone have put up at 800 million now, I think it is, to buy uh, the politicians they're interested in in the, for the upcoming U.S. election in a, is it next year. So the, to break through this requires first that enough people recognize that we're in the problem and insist that we confront it politically. We will need, I think, personally, I'm not advocating here, but until there are thousands of people marching in the streets for social and environmental justice, the political process, purchased as it is by the corporate sector, isn't going to budge on many of the issues we're concerned about. Do you mind if I go ahead? So uh, uh, this will just focus, and we've got uh, a couple of minutes here um, on something short. So uh, it, to the extent that humans, and maybe this is in debate, are smarter than yeast, uh, how must we best avoid killing each other as we descend on the backside of our global net energy curve? And unfortunately, we're going to have to try to keep this tight because if you think that you previously said you think the plenary was, would, would be interesting to hear what it sounds like on the hustings for the 2015 Canadian federal election, and our VP uh, treasurer is actually uh, running for the Green Party uh, this go around, can you? You have a large audience, a uh, plenary here, that are looking for solutions. They come to a, a conference to look for solutions of what can we put our energy towards, what can we study, what can we pass to others in two minutes or so, or, or so um, and not to be too partisan. Uh, what would you uh, ask from the audience or our political officials? Um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I was one of the founders of the Green Party many years ago, so congratulations that you're running. Um, so I am way beyond partisan um, for the Green Party. Uh, <clears throat> most important thing, obviously, is to get out and vote. I would challenge something that was said earlier, which is that, that there is no discussion about these issues. There is, in fact, discussion that goes on in the Green Party, and it goes on in smaller venues in, in other places. Elizabeth May and I are old friends. We've been friends for many years. And once we were on a train together and from going from Ottawa to Toronto, and I sat and interviewed her for about two and a half hours. This is not maybe you go out and vote for Elizabeth anyway, but this is this is just a story that we were we were sitting and talking and I said, what are you doing? Mom, why are you doing this? And I was trying to get her to get into the Green Party, because at that time she was the director of the Sierra Club. And um, she said, well, I don't think of myself as an environmentalist. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm a citizen. Because I figured that one day I can stop being an environmentalist and I can go back to being a citizen. I don't think being an environmentalist should be a full-time job. I'm an environmental professor. I don't think it should be a full-time job. I think it's part of being a citizen. And I think if we ask, if we occupy ourselves and work as citizens, because it's in some sense more whole than actually being pure environmentalist, if I put it that way, that was what she was arguing. And she also said that it was one of the ways in which she survived all the losses that she had to survive when she wasn't winning. So to go back and say, whatever else is going on, I'm still a citizen. And I think if we are going back to being citizens, I think we could do a much better job than we seem to be doing. Uh, this is a, we all want the silver bullet, the one simple answer to the question. This is a complex question beyond anything we've ever had to confront before. There are no silver bullets. But for democracy to work, you need a politically engaged, well-informed, self-critical population. And we don't have it. We have a population that has been brainwashed into submission. And those who haven't gone that route are simply disillusioned. So that the system is really in ruin because we do not have the great uh, political discussions of, the, of democracy that upon which the United States Constitution was founded. There's some marvelous writing in support of that document. We don't have the people, the rhetoricians or whatever you want to call them, uh, who promote uh, the citizen in democracy in this country anymore. It's all about acquisition, growth, incomes. The whole university system is now corrupted 
by a collapse of federal and provincial funding so that it has to prostitute itself to the corporate sector in order for major programs to be financed. Well, guess who then gets to call the research tune? So we've lost sight even in our education system of creating, of using the education system to create better citizens with an understanding of their historical and cultural and even biological, if I may so say so, roots. The whole purpose has become, are you employable when you get out of here? How well will you fit the machine? What kind of cogs can we make of you in the economics and engineering and other departments that actually get funded? Well, meanwhile, we see philosophy and the social sciences withering away on the vine. That's the mess we've got ourselves into. Because in a sense, as a culture, we've become fat, lazy, not very introspective. And uh, as a result, I think we are failing. And until we hit bottom like that alcoholic, we're not going to wake up with sufficient vigor to uh, turn anything around. Uh, I'd like to thank both of our speakers. So there. I think we do have a politically engaged, well-informed audience here. Um, there are still two more days, or two and a half more days to, to go to more sessions. The concurrent sessions, um, there's, a, there's a minimal break, uh, so you're going to uh, leave this room and then head into the concurrent sessions, um, followed by a break at 3.30. So, again, thanks again for the you, engaged discussion. Thank you. 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 Thank you.